Hello, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm doing my June reading wrap up. I am honestly so surprised that we are six months into this year and that I still have not hit 100 books read. I think that's the first time that's ever happened since I've been on YouTube, but have no fear. July is good. July is a new month and I'm going to be reading a shitload next month. That being said, I did read 21 books this month, which I'm pretty happy with. I feel like that's a pretty solid number. It feels very typical for me. I feel like I'm finally getting back into the swing of things as I feel like I've said every month this year, but you know what? 21 books. We're happy about that. Today I'm going to be talking to you about 12 slash 13 of those because a lot of the other other books I have talked about in dedicated themed TBR videos. I do have books on this list that I have talked about in weekly reading vlogs, but since I know that those are viewed a little bit less, I figured I'd take the opportunity to talk more in depth about those books here. So without further ado, let's get into it. We're off to a real start with this first one, A Baby for the Boss by Jessica Kane. This smutty little number is a 66 page novella about our main character Missy, who is essentially taking over her family business, which is essentially a bougier version of Spirit Halloween. She is a genius and no one seems to understand her. Everybody thinks she's a know-it-all. And so Missy thinks that the solution to this is to have a baby because a baby will be forced to love her because she's the mom. But getting the seed that she needs proves to be a trickier task than Missy had previously thought. She doesn't really know how she's gonna go about finding a partner to have some sex with. She has absolutely zero self-esteem, so she doesn't really think anyone's gonna wanna be with her long-term. But one day she sees a really hunky dude with a really hairy chest uh, and he works in her warehouse and she's like, that's the father of my child. So she hits him up and she's like, hey, would you like to impregnate me? And because Missy is hot and has an amazing rack and apparently her bowl tastes like cherries, this guy is like totally on board and he is so down to impregnate Miss Missy. And so that's what this story is about. It's 66 pages, so not much happens except for a lot of bumping and grinding. There's a lot of dirty talk. There's a dude with a that is apparently the size of an Arizona iced tea can. We've got sexual encounters on the toilet. I mean, we've got it all in 66 pages. So I really feel like hats off to Jessica Kane for being able to really pull that off. If you were not really here for any of the things that I just mentioned, I don't know that this book will be for you, but maybe the book advertised at the end of this book, simply titled Truck Driver, will be more your speed. I love Jessica Kane books when I need a good palate cleanser because they never fail to make me laugh. I still find myself recommending Back River Quiver, which I believe is like a collaboration with Alexa Riley, who are an author writing duo that really writes some unhinged smut. I just, you know what? It was a good time. Do I rate my smut? No. Would I recommend this? No. I mean, it was fun. It was a fun time, but was it something that was good? Also, no. A book that I did rate, I did enjoy, and I do recommend is Reputation by Lex Croucher. I really enjoyed this book. It is, I think, advertised, I, I mean, I've heard it advertised about a million different ways at this point. In my eyes, it is Mean Girls Meets Emma by Jane Austen. And while it wasn't perfect, it was a really fun time. We've got bitchy friends, hot and judgmental love interest, very much like Mr. Knightley. And we have some darker commentary on consent and what reputation means in the 1800s that I wasn't expecting and did kind of bring the tone of the story down, but was overall kind of appreciated. Is the main character in this book, Georgiana, a bit of a see you next Tuesday? Absolutely. But I loved her commentary. I absolutely found myself laughing out loud at her interactions, especially with her love interest. And honestly, all that I'm really looking for in a story nowadays is to either giggle or to blush. This book did honestly both of those things pretty well, so I gave this one four stars. I'm very excited to see what this author puts out next. I think the only other thing that she has put out to date is like a memoir kind of thing. I think this is her first fiction novel. I'd be wrong, didn't really look too hard at her backlist, but I think she has another historical kind of rom-com coming out, and I'm very, very excited to pick that one up. I would recommend this one, I do think, of all of the books on this list. This one is, I don't know, I feel like this one has the most potential to be a book that people dislike. I think given the reviews especially, I think it's a very mixed bag, but I, I had a really good time with it. Okay, so Someone lied to me. By someone, I mean a lot of you in the comment section of the video in which I read this book. Y'all said that the movie adaptation of the book was better, and I could not disagree more. Something Borrowed by Emily Giffen was a train wreck. I mean, the book was bad, the movie was worse. Overall, I had a good time with it though. This book is about two main characters. I want to say Rachel and Darcy. Rachel is our heroine, and at the start of the story, she ends up mistakenly sleeping with her horrible, horrible best friend, friend of me, whatever, fiance, right? The whole story is attempting to justify the fact that Rachel is repeatedly sleeping with Darcy's fiance, Dex? Short for Dexter. And I know that other things happen along the way and that the story is supposed to make you sympathetic to Rachel, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't work though <laughs> as a story in general. It was too fucking long. It was really boring and it had really no depth. Now, here's, here's the thing, right? I wasn't expecting much from the book, but I guess I was expecting this kind of story to fully go there and to fully get me to care about the characters and or feel emotionally invested in some of the characters because if you're gonna do a story about cheating, you have to justify it. If the whole point here is for me to be like, you know what, Rachel really does deserve Dex. Darcy doesn't deserve anything good. I'm gonna need to feel like Rachel is deserving of some of some good. And I don't feel like she was. Nothing in the story really justified her actions. I mean, I guess there were 
some like bitchy frenemy moments between Rachel and Darcy but also Rachel never really expressed her discontent with the way Darcy treated her so it was like girl I don't know that sleeping with someone's fiance and completely shattering their trust is necessarily the way to go here I could be off base here I could be off base but that's sort of how I was feeling and I think it was made worse in the movie which I read very quickly after the book because Dex has no fucking personality so it's like why is Rachel so invested in this man who has absolutely zero flavor it really didn't make sense to me but it, w it was weird it was a weird movie it was a weird book and I sort of don't really understand why it existed I'm definitely as I've said multiple times on my channel not opposed to having cheating in stories I think it, I don't want to say done well <laughs> cheating done well I think it needs to be justified I think it can be justified kind of sometimes I mean not in real life but like in a story I like the drama okay I like the drama this just was not well executed do I recommend it no do I also sort of recommend it because it was entertaining and it gave me like good 2000s vibes I guess kind of uh, but there are some like problematic elements too in the story talking about like body shaming specifically and body dysmorphia and and weight and bleh. so I don't know I don't know proceed at your own risk I gave it two stars move to the back seat preemptively because I know my camera is going to overheat in this 95 degree weather on my dashboard book number four is bringing down the duke by Evie Dunmore now this is a book that I initially rated two stars but I was willing to see the error of my ways upon reread I reread this book for a video that I'm doing in a little bit that I feel like I've talked about way too many fucking times in these wrap-ups but it's a video in which I'm reading top 10 historical romances according to you and a lot of y'all seem to like this and I was like you know what I need to give this a reread because I don't remember that much about it except for I don't know hating it and so I wanted to have enough talking points and enough to say about the book for that video and honestly upon reread it didn't suck that bad I ended up giving it three stars the second time around the story follows our heroine who is a suffragette trying to convince a duke that he should vote in favor of women's right to vote and he is unwilling to do this because he doesn't really believe in it and he is being convinced by other parties other people in his life that women shouldn't have the right to vote right initially uh, the first time I read this book I was like I don't know that I want a guy who I'm gonna have to convince that I need fundamental rights but I will say I think what changed my mind about the story this time around is that our Duke the reasons that he has for not wanting women to have the right to vote they weren't really his own reasons he didn't have any like fundamental dislike of women or their um, independence and or autonomy it was more so that he was being convinced by the Queen of England and other people around him that he shouldn't do this because I think he was trying to like win back his family home or something like that I can't remember all of the details even reading it a second time but seeing as the Duke is less shitty upon reread and because I did end up kind of enjoying the dialogue between the hero and heroine I feel like this book wasn't that bad I mean do I really want to read a romance about voting rights no but can I appreciate what this book did for the most part sure next up book number five one that I gave five stars to part of your world by Abby Jimenez this book surprised the fuck out of me I have not had any luck with an Abby Jimenez book I think the highest I've ever rated her books is three stars the majority of her stories that I've read I've given two stars to and you're like Chandler why the fuck do you keep picking these books up and the answer is because apparently a lot of people like them they always end up on list videos and so I am forced to read Abby Jimenez books now I'm not actually upset because I gave this book five stars and I am so overjoyed honestly that I finally found a book by this author that I enjoy because frankly I have never disliked her writing I've never disliked the care and attention she puts into the emotions behind her character's actions I think what I've disliked historically are the characters themselves I feel like they never really connect with me and I never really understand their decisions and or they just like aren't decisions I would make that's not to say that I can't sympathize or empathize with characters but a lot of the times the decisions that the characters in her books make I'm just like what this book however is a really delightful story about our main character Alexis Montgomery which sounds suspiciously similar to Addison Montgomery from Grey's Anatomy which kind of makes sense given that our main character is a surgeon or I guess an emergency medicine doctor there's a distinction there because all of her family are surgeons and they're like oh she's not good enough because she's in emergency medicine the story is about Alexis kind of finding her way in the world after she gets out of a really shitty relationship it's like the lights turned on inside of her head and she realized oh I am in a gaslighty emotionally abusive relationship I need to get out of this oh my god my relationship with my parents is kind of shitty oh my god I don't actually like my job as much as I thought that I did and she kind of figures this all out as she is getting to know this guy in a small town that she stops by one day this guy's name is Daniel he is is running I think a bed and breakfast and he's also a carpenter slash woodworker he makes furniture he is like the bright sunshiny just delightful person in Alexis's life who kind of shows her that there is good in the world and that she should kind of pursue what she actually wants I loved this story so much I feel like this was kind of dark at times because we do have Alexis kind of dealing with some of the shittier people in her life but I felt like it was really powerful and really empowering I think what really took this story and made it different than others that I've read 
like it with abusive uh, relationships kind of in them is that Alexis, while she is learning, she never really allows herself to fully be walked all over. And I understand everybody learns at a different pace and everybody behaves differently as a result of their trauma. So I'm not trying to say that other representations of trauma and or abusive relationships are wrong. In fact, there is another example of an abusive relationship within this story, but I just really, I just could connect with Alexis on a deeper level. And I feel like it was a really good example of just because you are a strong person, just because you have this amazing career and this like, you know, seemingly perfect life doesn't mean that you are not someone who can fall prey and fall victim to shitty people, you know? No, I just really liked the story. Daniel was fucking incredible. He's one of my favorite heroes that I've read this year, definitely book boyfriend material. And I just really liked the interactions between Alexis and Daniel. So anyway, if you were looking for a kind of um, emotional romance that you could potentially cry at, I might recommend this book. This is a really, really solid story. One that I didn't expect to like, but uh, I really fell for. Book, line, and sinker, and will likely end up on my best of the year list. So moving on to book number six, halfway there, Calypso by David Sedaris. This is a collection of short stories and or memoirs of our writer's life. I don't want to say I grew up reading this author, but my parents had a lot of David Sedaris on their shelves, and I remember picking up, I think in like high school, maybe late middle school, um, Me Talk Pretty one day, and I just connected with it so much. I just loved a lot of the short stories and vignettes, and I just remember one of them to this day and just how fucking funny I thought it was. I got Calypso, I want to say, as like a book of the month selection a few years ago. I think it was maybe last year. Anyway, it was really, really delightful. I listened to this on audio. It's narrated by the author, and something about the way he tells stories and the way that he can make something simultaneously humorous and heartbreaking just always connects and works for me. I typically don't rate nonfiction, but I did end up giving this one four stars simply because, I don't know, I just felt like it was a four star read. I just liked it and I want people to see it in my Goodreads reviews and, and realize that like this is good and you should pick it up. I don't think it's gonna work for everybody. I never really expected to connect so deeply with a story about one man's journey to pick up trash to beat his Fitbit walking goals. I don't know, I just thought it was nice. I just feel like the little nuggets of wisdom baked into the humor worked for me. And it was short. It was delightful. I don't know. Put it on hold for my library. Pick it up. I thought it was fun. This next book too is another one that I picked up off of my owned TBR shelf. Pillow Thoughts by Courtney Peppernell. I can appreciate that this was gay, but I'm just not in Instagram caption poetry gal. While this one was, I think, more bearable in a lot of ways than some of the other ones that I have been forced to read for various videos over the years, I really should not have purchased this book. And I'm learning that about a lot of the books that I have to pick up before this goal of mine, which is to read all of my backlist. I just don't like poetry. And I think this is the only poetry on my shelves left, which is very good to know. The fact that I like bought this recently too, after knowing that I don't like poetry is just beyond me. I guess I was just in an emotional mood at Target. I felt compelled and um, I'm glad that I'm on a book buying ban because now I cannot fall victim and fall prey to Target. Manipulating my emotions and make me pick up books that I shouldn't be picking up. Anyway, book slash novella number nine, Below Zero by Allie Hazelwood. I really feel like what I'm realizing as I have looked at your comments about the novella series is that I think your reading order definitely depends for these stories in terms of what you're going to like, right? If you read them in order, I think the third book might end up being your least favorite because all of them feel the fucking same. First one feels fresh, exciting, new, cool, and then the longer you read, you're just like, what the fuck? Like, all of these are about big strong man, Polly Pocket Lady, sordid love affairs in a STEM setting. I also read somewhere that all of these might be Raylo fan fiction just turned into not so obvious Raylo fan fiction, and I could definitely believe that because all of these feel fucking same. Below Zero, though, I read first and I did end up liking a little bit more than the second book that I read, which was the second one in the series. Uh, anyway, Below Zero is about our main character, Hannah, who is working for NASA, and she ends up going to a very cold place, gets stuck in the snow, and she's kind of recounting and relaying her relationship she's had, relationship, sexual encounter she's had with this man named Ian. Ian, while she is trapped in the snow, he's on the phone with her and is like, hey, I'm coming to get you, and they talk at the time that he's coming to get her. So you've got a little bit of like present day and a little bit of sexual encounters. And I thought it was nice. I liked the way the story was told. Even though it was a novella, it felt like it was very complete as a story. I liked that at the very beginning, we understand who Hannah is, what her goals and aspirations are, and like why she doesn't really want to be in a romantic relationship. I don't know. It worked for me. I thought it was fun. I thought it was kind of sexy. I do like the whole like inexperienced hero thing, which this one did as opposed to the second one which was the 10th book that I read this month. Stuck With You is another Steminist novella. We have a heroine named Sadie and a hero named Eric. They're both engineers, and I don't give a fuck about either of them. If you want to read a novella that feels like Raylo fan fiction, I would say pick this up. Otherwise, skip it. I, I don't know if I said, but the last one I gave four stars to, this one I gave two stars to, and I think I'm probably gonna hate the first one, uh, which I haven't read yet, and I don't have off of hold for my library, but um, I'll be reading at some point. Next up at number 11, we have Only Mostly Devastated by Sophie Gonzalez. This is a YA 
Greece retelling. I got sent this book from the publisher. I could have immediately gotten rid of it, but I had heard good things from my friends, and even though I don't typically pick up YA contemporaries, I was like, there's no reason to immediately get rid of this book. After reading it, I kind of feel like I probably should have immediately gotten rid of it. Not that it's a bad book by any means. Um, it's just not really something that I connected with, and it makes sense because it's a YA book, and the older I get, the less I connect with YA books. Which isn't to say that if you are, you know, older than I am, that you shouldn't be able to connect with YA books. I'm just saying, like, I personally don't super connect with them anymore. This is about Will and Ollie. I think Ollie is our narrator and Will is his crush. They spent a summer together. I don't remember where, but they spent a summer together. Beach setting and I don't know, they just got really, really close. Will was not out to his family, but Ollie didn't really care because it was just like one summer together and they had fun. And afterwards, after that summer, Ollie is like texting Will and trying to get him to like I don't know, pay attention to him, and Will just doesn't reply after the summer. Ollie has to move across the country with his family to take care of his ailing aunt. He ends up at the same school that Will um, attends. I liked that this book had a non-traumatic coming out moment. Will does end up coming out to his family, and it was not traumatizing in my opinion, so I really appreciated that. It was, it was just a part of the story. It wasn't like the whole story. I think what irritated me so much was that Will throughout the entire story is just so unwilling to like admit his feelings for Ollie and or to be himself around his friends and again I get it like everybody goes through different things it makes a lot of sense and it is I think probably authentic to a lot of young people's experiences to not be out and to feel like you can't be yourself around your friends uh, in fear of judgment or whatever high school guys are brutal I understand not wanting to like come out around around your guy friends but it just made for a, a pretty unenjoyable reading experience especially because I didn't really care about Ollie's like band stuff he was like in a band I want to say and also he had a group of female friends who were just like kind of bitchy and I didn't really understand them I don't no, I didn't really care about any of that stuff and so with the romance not being very satisfying or like fulfilling and then also not having great like side stuff going on it just it wasn't a great story for me I didn't rate this on Goodreads because I'm not the target audience for this story and I also just feel like I don't know I don't want to bring the overall rating down just because the book wasn't for me but I just picked it up on a whim uh, but if I were to rate it I think I would give this book two stars it just like wasn't the most impactful story for me the 12th book the last book that I completely finished was the family plot by Megan Collins and oh my god <laughs> this was not great um which sucks because this had such an interesting concept. It's about our main character, Dahlia, who I want to say is named after Dahlia that was murdered, like the famous Dahlia. All of the children in her family, all, all four of them, are named after like murder victims or murderers or something like that. Very bizarre because their mom was very obsessed with murder and there were a string of murders that happened in their small town that were never solved. I think like a bunch of women were drowned or something or were like found in the ocean in like blue dresses and they're all dead. So they spent all of their adolescence, I guess, like being homeschooled and learning about murders and like honoring murder victims. And also their grandparents were brutally murdered back in the day. The guns that they manufactured. It's a, it's a very spooky family, right? And everyone kind of connects with death in different ways. I think one of the daughters makes like murder scene dioramas. Everybody's a little bit strange, which I thought was an interesting, an interesting setup, right? An interesting like cast of characters to carry out the story. In the beginning of the story, the premise of this book is that the younger brother who was best friends with Dahlia, there's like two older siblings, two younger siblings, and I think Dahlia and Andy were twins. Andy ends up being found murdered in his father's grave. Father recently passed away and they're like going to bury him and they're like, oh shit, Andy's actually in this grave, which is scary, spooky, and murdery. But the thing was, none of the characters ended up being interesting enough to carry the story. I liked the premise, like just reading the synopsis at, at the store, which is where I, <laughs> I purchased this book. I was like, this is going to be fun. Like regardless of who done it, like this is going to be a good story. But the thing was, it was just strangely told. I didn't really understand the direction the story was going in. It didn't feel like there were reveals that went on throughout the story that made sense. I mean, there were reveals, there were twists. Did not skip out on the twists, but none of them really made sense, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of a thriller, in my opinion. Yes, I understand that's not a mystery, but like, I want things to like slowly add up and it just get creepier and creepier and creepier over time. And it just didn't happen. I said it in my vlog of this book, but I feel like someone like Gillian Flynn could have carried out the story in a more interesting way because I feel like for this kind of book to work, I would need to understand the characters and their motivations a little bit more and or just them as people. And I really didn't understand any of these characters, even our heroine who's telling the entire story. So. so this one was kind of a fail for me and I ended up giving it two stars. Now that's the last book that I completely finished, a book that I am currently working on and will likely finish today, but I like didn't want to wait until it was super, super hot to film this video. The No Show by Beth O'Leary. I am not enjoying this. I'm only reading it for a list video. 
as one does. This story is about three women who are all unknowingly dating the same guy. At the beginning of the story, all three of these very, very different women are stood up by a guy who is very charming, very debonair, and has like, I don't know, just a really great personality that seems to like somehow capture the attention of all three of these women. And I think it's Valentine's Day that they're all stood up. And we're getting, I guess, more information about these women and how they could potentially be fooled into dating a guy who's like never really around because he's like dating three different fucking women. I think we're gonna find out throughout the story that he's not actually three timing these women. Maybe this is like all different years or something. I'm not entirely sure. We do know that his mom has dementia. And for some reason, I'm kind of thinking that like maybe he is dating all of these women because his mom has dementia. I don't know. I think he might, or maybe he's like gaslighting his mom. I'm making this book sound much more interesting than it is. It's not that interesting. I'm not totally loving it. I liked The Flat Share, okay, by Beth O'Leary, but this book is just not really, not really doing it for me. But I am intrigued enough to find out what happens to that twist ending. And I do kind of want to have like my full thoughts, feelings, emotions, etc. sorted before I make that list video in September, I do believe. So that will be the 13th book that I read this month. I guess not 13th, like the 21st book total, but that's, that's it. Those are all the books that I read this month. I did read some other really delightful ones for a KU vlog, which I will link in the description down below if you want thoughts and feelings and opinions on sexy, smutty, Kindle Unlimited romances. I do have video reading three, one of which I gave five stars to. So if you want more thoughts and feelings and you want to see more of my videos, check that one out. I feel like this is usually the time that I take to let you know what's coming in the month ahead, so maybe I'll give you a little preview. I launched my Patreon on Friday, so if you want to become a part of the little baby or big baby tiers, <laughs> uh, more information about that is in the description down below. If you join the little baby tier, essentially you're going to be getting a couple of reading sprints from me, and you're going to get to see what I'm going to be posting for the coming months, and you're going to get to be a part of my monthly book club where we read smutty stories every single month. This month we are reading Twisted Lives by Anna Huang, which I'm super, super hyped about. But if you want even more from me, you want even more reading sprints, you want an exclusive reading vlog, you want your name at the end of my videos, you can join the big baby tier. Or if you don't want any of that, you want to support me at a smaller dollar amount, you can join the DBBC family, which is a monthly live show that Hayden and I are going to be putting on as a way to say thank you for your support of my channel. I think that tier is like $2.99. It's a channel membership here on YouTube instead of on Patreon. Another option for y'all if you don't want to get on Patreon. And that one's going to be a once a month, three hour live stream with Hayden and I, where we just kind of fuck around, maybe read a little bit, maybe some reading sprints, but mostly just like hanging out with y'all. So that's what's new and fresh and exciting with me. July is going to be a super hectic and busy month, but I'm so looking forward to it. I feel like I've got my shit together. I've got a schedule. Obviously I have a schedule because on my Patreon, go and see what my reading schedule is for the month. But I have at least three videos coming for the entire month of July. And I'm just excited to connect with y'all on a deeper level and or just here on YouTube, you know, like with more videos, more stuff to say more stuff for y'all to reply to. <laughs> but I so, so appreciate you, whether you support me on Patreon, channel memberships or not. I love you so much. Thanks so much for watching this video and until next time.